Hello, and welcome to another Ancient World Magazine podcast. If you enjoy the podcast, don't forget to subscribe on whichever service you use to listen to podcasts. If you could rate and review us too, that would also help us out. Additional thanks go to our Patreon supporters, especially Rachel K. Bicknell, Joshua A., and Ian Barr. If you would like to support AWM on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash ancient world mag. And now, time for the podcast. My name is Joshua Browers, and I'm the editor of Ancient World Magazine. Hello, my name is Matthew Lloyd. I'm contributing editor at Ancient World Magazine, and I also am the curatorial administrator at the Norwich and District Museum in Norwich, Ontario, that has nothing ancient in it, but will be relevant to the conversation coming up, I'm sure. I'm Joshua Hall. I'm also a contributing editor for Ancient World Magazine, and I am a frequent museum visitor, although obviously with COVID, that has kind of fallen off. I'm Helena Messi. I'm a archaeologist and I've been working as a tour guide for the past couple of years and love going to museums and love <laughs> hating museum displays, I suppose. Excellent, because hating museums is one of the things that I enjoy doing better. <laughs> 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 we start with a positive, yeah, yeah. though. Should we start with, like, your favourite museum, if you have one? Yeah. What is your favourite museum, globally, that you've been to? The Etruscan Gallery at the Vatican Museum, hmm? I think, is very well put together. And given that it is a very wide-ranging collection, going from the early Iron Age through the classical period it's laid out in such a way that you can kind of see the development of etruscan art styles from i don't want to say entirely indigenous but generally pre-contact etruscan art styles all the way through greek influence and greek contact based on the way that the museum is laid out where you enter into essentially the early iron age and then proceed through to the classical era and for me that's one of the great triumphs in museum displays simply because a lot of other etruscan Etruscan museums are very much a hodgepodge of artifacts throughout periods, and there's not always a well-thought-out organization. Hmm. My favorite one, it's in London, so the John, John Soane Museum. People don't know who, what it is. It's a kind of house museum of this architect who lived in the 17 and 1800s, and it's been kept as there's not really that much kind of instruction on kind of what what you're looking at it's kind of maintained as it, as it was and i like to think of it as a home of an architect <laughs> who had a hoarding problem it's just absolutely packed with stuff and you just kind of wander in and it, you kind of get the sense of what his students who he was teaching in his home would have gotten this kind of impression of that there's just so much to see and you kind of you end up kind of looking up and down and a little bit kind of confused on your first visit but a very interesting museum i think what, what josh mentioned about a museum where you can see how things change across time. The Heraklion Museum in Crete has something similar where you go from room to room and you advance through the ages basically. So you you start at the Neolithic I think and then you go into eventually protopalatial, neopalatial, postpalatial stuff. So that's a very nice museum, very nicely laid out. But I think my favorite museum that I've ever been in is the Historical Museum in Stockholm, Historiska which focuses on something that that I always emphasize archaeological museums don't really do. Most archaeological museums are like collections of things, and the historical museum in Sweden has, or it had at least, I don't know, I haven't been there for a few years, but it had a whole department that was laid out like the departure halls in an airplane, all dedicated to archaeology and to how archaeology worked. So it explained how typologies work using modern brooms and brushes, for example, and all that sort of stuff. And that's, that's probably the, the closest I've been to, or the closest museum that I know that, that actually uh, emphasizes archaeology as a discipline, rather than being an archaeological museum that consists of just lots of things put together. We won't undoubtedly get into this in more detail, but that's that's one of the, the most favorite museums that I've been to. Hmm. So I was thinking when we started, my answer is going to be the Napoleon Museum in the Argolid, and I think that's largely because of the stuff in it. Because like this is where the Dendra panoply is. It's got this Submycenaean burial from Tyrans that's one of my favorite things, and the Tyrans Bothros, and lots of really good things from the Argolid that are well displayed. But while Helena was talking, I remembered this house. I'd been to in Vienna that I can't remember any of the details of, and I was trying to look up its name in my Vienna photographs, 
and I stumbled across the Vienna Technical Museum, which is... I went in 2007, so it's been 13 years, but it was just a museum with a bunch of really fun stuff to play with, from recording, like, television stuff, to toy trains, and I think real trains, and... Uh, it's been too long. Oh, yeah, there's this uh, exercise wheel, like a gerbil would use, but for people. And, you know... Oh, and... Like, a... You know the thing with the nuclear reactors where you're picking up the uh, the things with radioactive things yeah, the in rods? Them with the hand yeah, anyway? Yeah. yeah, the rods. Yeah, like the rods, one of yeah. those to play with. Like not a real one, <laughs> a model one. Anyway, I just remember that museum as being like this incredibly enjoyable experience. <laughs> Huh. And on that same trip, we went to the Luxembourg. I think it's the National Museum of Luxembourg, which is, uh, that one is laid out so as you go down the building, you go back in time, and as you go up, you go forward in time. And that was an interesting layout. Again, it was 13 years ago, so I can't remember it in great detail, considering that they didn't allow photographs, so, like, I've not seen the inside of it since being in there. <laughs> I remember pretty distinctly a few things about it. I think accidentally going through a doorway at one point and winding up in a reconstruction of like a 16th, 17th century house. And like, there was no indication that that was what was going to happen as I went through that door. <laughs> like, oh, that was quite a museum. Surprise is an interesting, like a, an oddly satisfactory experience in a museum, mm. or by my judgment <clears throat> at least. I've experienced that in the UK a few times. Cardiff Castle Museum, it's, you know, an old, what, 18th century folly, essentially by um, the Butte family and when you tour it now though you know you can go from older sections that are fairly mundane though obviously built by a very wealthy person into a room that is essentially walled with gold and it's it's very shocking when you don't know that that's coming yeah. up but it makes for a nice museum experience I think yeah yeah I think uh, and I think you mentioned like, kind of a surprise in museums what, one thing so I, I do tours in the, in the Bruges Museum but before I started to do that before I moved to London one of my first times in the British Museum, I'm kind of wandering down the halls without that much of an aim. I wanted to get to the kind of Greek and Roman sections. And then there's the narrowed mm. monument, this kind of temple looking burial monument. And it's kind of part of it is reconstructed as the monument. And, and the other part is kind of spread out uh, in the other side of, of the room. So you can kind of look at the friezes and, and other kind of sculpture more, more up close. So I, I was kind of, you kind of appreciate kind of what, what you see as you're kind of turning around in that room. And then I thought, I'm going to go and see what's in the back of the reconstructed bit of it. And there's a door there. <laughs> so no sign that the museum continues here. So then you got to go through that door. And the first thing you see is one of the caryatids from the Eretheion in Athens, which is surely, I thought, would be in a more kind of prominent position uh, in, the muse <laughs> in the museum. But it's in this kind of room that you kind of don't know is there unless you kind of want to see what's at the back of this reconstruction. So it was this kind of, <laughs> it's that element of surprise that was really like, whoa, what, what's this? <laughs> Why is this kind of yeah. quasi hidden here? <laughs> there are a few bits right there in the British Museum where it's like, oh, this is here. Because round there is sort of the staircase up to the Bassai sculptures as well. I can't remember if it's that end or the other mm. end. It's at the other yeah. end from, from the narrate, the yeah. reconstruction. And it's like, it's in, oh, yeah. this is here. Yeah. If you know it's there, and you check the times it's actually open, then maybe you can go up there. <laughs> yeah, yep. they've snuck a lot of things in there. Yeah, and I think as they close mm. certain rooms at certain times, you kind of, the schedule mm. kind of keeps changing. I think I had been to the British Museum maybe kind of 15 times before I'm again stumbling into this room yeah. behind the Red Road Monument where there's kind of Athenian stuff, and then as you go through another door, you bump into, there's the mausoleum yeah. of Halligarnassas, and you're like, <laughs> this is here, again, no signs pointing out. Yeah. <laughs> that it's there um, and I, I'd been to that room with the, the mausoleum room uh, a few times and I was just kind of walking past and I saw there was a staircase going down and that always been blocked there was always you know that you know you can't I thought it was just some sort of you know staff storage but it was open I'm like I'm gonna go and see what's what's down these stairs and that's <laughs> where they keep inscriptions um, <laughs> so, so there was very interesting inscriptions from kind of around Greece different chronological <laughs> Clearly, it's kind of forgotten room mm. in the museum. That's I, I think now it hasn't been open for yeah. quite a long time. But it was yeah. this brief moment where, where if you were there at the right time, you could, you could go down there. I can't remember when this was. I think it was 2016. But since I've been living in Canada, one of the times when I was back in the UK and going to 
the British Museum. And I really wanted to see the Bassai room and the the classical vases room that's sort of above the Lydian stuff. Yeah, the study collection room. And yeah. they have times yeah. that it's open. So I went for the times that it was open and it wasn't open. If you find that, go and complain to someone on the desk because normally they'll find someone who can take you up there who will then complain that you're spending too long in there and ask you to hurry up. But, you know, <laughs> you can be in there for a while. Just a hint for, uh, is the British Museum reopened? Uh, it's opening, I think, next week. But it's just the downstairs galleries. Well, whenever you feel safe going back to the British Museum, if you do, then that's a hint for you about how to get into those rooms. Doesn't work in a lot of museums. <laughs> yeah. When I went to Heraklion, also the Archaeological Museum there last year, the pottery collection, which I really wanted to see, which is on the, the first floor, behind the corridor hallway room with the frescoes, was very, very close. And that usually mm. happens in museums in Greece and Italy, that there's always rooms that are closed. The Archaeological Museum in Naples is especially bad because they have rooms that are open every other day. So that means that if you want to see mm-hmm. everything, you have to go two days and pay the tickets twice. And it's very expensive <laughs> nowadays, so it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Quite annoying. <laughs> it's a good scam, though. Yeah, I know. It is an excellent scam. <laughs> it, it's it's a bugbear of mine not not to have, not to have everything open and available to the to the public because it should be. Yeah. When I went to Delos in 2013, firstly, the last ferry was leaving Delos an hour earlier than scheduled for, as far as I could tell, no reason. So if you're going to Delos, go as early as possible in case that happens. But the room they'd closed off is the prehistoric room, which is the room I'm most interested in because, you know, I do early Iron Age things. I was traveling with my wife, Whitney, and she sort of saw I was disappointed with this. She went and spoke to the staff there and were like, look, this guy, he's a member of the excavation team at Left Candy. He's here for one day. He really wants to see the early Iron Age stuff. I think may have dropped like the University of Oxford and Professor Arini Lamas names as well. <laughs> and they were like, okay, if you come back like in the last hour before the ferry leaves, then we'll let him in to have a look. So we did that. And then apparently people came up while we were in there and we're sort of like oh is this open can we go in and have a look then they can have the excuse no that's an archaeologist who is allowed in there um but it is closed for <laughs> non so have someone else to complain for you that's another tip <laughs> i think that's a very north american thing oh. and probably one of the great benefits of marrying a canadian <laughs> is that we we generally do speak our minds more more so than oh. especially especially yeah. brits definitely served me well while living in the uk to be a little bit more aggressive when it came to customer service <laughs> yeah. i was going to say like when i when you were talking about the etruscans gallery when i went to the vatican museum in 2006 I really wanted to see Exekias's Ajax Nicholas playing a game. I don't know if that's in the Etruscan mm. gallery. I don't remember. Anyway, I couldn't find it. Um, but around the Vatican museums, there are several gift shops. And not being able to speak any Italian, my way of asking directions was to pick up a DVD box that had the vase in the front of it and be like, where is this? <laughs> uh, it was really close at the time. It was like down the stairs and through that door. I was like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's my experience in the Vatican Museum. The Vatican Museum is one of those that it's so big, it shouldn't be an enjoyable experience. Mm. But I've always loved it. I I love the Egyptian gallery there as well. I don't know Egypt well enough to say if it's laid out and, you know, constructed in a way to give you a good view of Egyptian history and archaeology at all. It's very nice. I've only been to the Vatican Museum once, and we had to queue for ages to get in because, yeah, the week we were there, it was like the week before Easter, which is probably the worst time to go to Rome. (laughs) (laughs) The the holiest week in uh, in the Catholic calendar. Well, we we also saw the Pope talk, so, you know, we got our uh, Catholic on. It was the last Pope, so... (laughs) You know, not as good as, like, the current Pope. Darth Pope. Yeah, him. (laughs) Or Pope Pope Palpatine. Benedict the 16th was his official name. Palpy for friends. Obviously, we wanted to go and see, like, the famous stuff. We wanted to see the Sistine Chapel. So we kind of rushed through, like, all these fantastic corridors with all these magnificent wall paintings by, like, Raphael and other turtles (laughs) to get to 
the Sistine Chapel, and it sort of feels like this is the kind of museum that you'd have to spend, like, a month in to see everything worth seeing. And I spent a day, and it was an exhausting day. But I guess I saw the three main things, the uh, Laocoon, Sistine Chapel, Exequias, Ajax and Achilles playing a game. It's the three main things in that museum, is that it? <laughs> For some people, yeah. For some people, I'm sure it is. <laughs> that, that's, um, that's definitely one way of experiencing mm. that museum. I've, I've been a few times, um, obviously, though, as a Romanist and an Etruscologist, that is much more up my alley, that particular museum. But there are some secrets with the Vatican Museum, and one is to skip that horrible line that usually stretches up the wall mm. there. So for for listeners who haven't been to the Vatican Museum, the main entrance is essentially a, um, a portal through the wall that surrounds Vatican City, and you'll see a line that can stretch for probably at least a kilometer up that wall at the height of tourist season. But you can generally skip that if you buy a ticket through a guide, mm. because they have a certain number of tickets that can get in, like the special guide entrance at any given time. But there's no obligation to stay with them, and there are actually some guide companies that will sell tickets online with the express purpose of just getting you in and skipping the line. And the guide themselves doesn't even go through the museum with you. Like, there's no option to do that, which is probably the best way of getting into the Vatican Museum. Because the first time I was in Rome, actually, I stayed in a hotel that overlooked that entrance. And I think even when I got up at 8, 8.30 in the morning, the line was already to my window and I was a few blocks up from it so it is helpful to do that but once you get in I mean that crowd is going to be there and oh. I'm sure you experienced this Matt but the Sistine Chapel is just kind of a nightmare yeah. in terms of trying to enjoy I don't know if Joshua and Helena if you've been to the Vatican Museum and done the Sistine Chapel but they sort of herd you in oh. and even though it's supposed to be you know a very idyllic beautiful room and it is I mean the frescoes are all amazing you're packed into a very small chapel chapel with a couple hundred other people I would guess. Yeah. It makes it a very awkward experience. Everyone's sort of craning their neck up to look at the ceiling and getting shushed every now and again because it's got to be quiet. <laughs> Well, yeah, because it is, I mean, well, technically it's a consecrated yeah. church, so, you know, you have to follow yeah. all of the rules that you would in any other Catholic sanctuary. Yeah. As sort of coda to this story, the friend I visited Rome with that first time, I guess the end of last year, it must have been, he went back to Rome, he works for the BBC, went back to Rome and made a BBC Sounds documentary with the Pope's choir, I can't remember their name, but it's like the Pope's personal choir, and recorded in the Sistine Chapel, them singing, so, you know, he got to experience it with no one else in there. <laughs> huh. uh, good for him. I, I have no hard feelings about that at all. I suppose that's the kind of thing nowadays with these big museums. So I've never been to the Vatican Museum. I think mainly I've been to Rome quite a few times, but I've always oh. been there in August. <laughs> Uh, and you just know it's going to be horrendous. So I've yeah I haven't been, been to the museum. It's, it's it's on my list list of things to do. But the British Museum, in because that's that's where I'm mo most kind of familiar with. It's starting to get these incredible crowds as well. Last last summer was absolutely horrendous, much worse than the previous summer. And it really kind of when you see something you know that famous, something that you've kind of read about and for decades kind of seeing it pop up everywhere, and then you're kind of pushed through, kind of you know tick your mm. box and then get out. As I heard from clients last summer, they w went to Paris, they went to the Louvre, and when you get to Mona Lisa, there was a very kind of regimented way of just one way system, just packed, and you get, you know, two seconds and then you're out because this is the queues are just so long, which makes a very, very, very different museum experience than I think what most people would like. So comparing, say, the Rosetta Stone in the British Museum and the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, the Rosetta Stone I've never had a good look at because there's always crowds of people around it. With the Mona Lisa, when I went, which was in 2007. We did a trip around Europe, that's why everything happened in 2007 for me. <laughs> There's a bit of space in front of it, so everyone's sort of a meter or so back. It's high enough on the wall so that if you're tall <laughs> enough, you can sometimes see over the crowd a bit better and see it for a bit more time. I found it interesting that there are a bunch of signs up saying do not take pictures, and then when you get to the front they're like, take a picture, which was interesting. So I do, with the Mona Lisa, it feels like you are sort of shuffled through, but it felt 
feels better to me than what happens with the Rosetta Stone, where, again, I, I haven't tried to see it in a few years, but it definitely feels like there's less organization around that, and people are just there crowded around it. And so you sort of have to wait your turn and get in, but there's no method to it. It just force your way through the crowd. Yeah, my, my first encounter with the, with the Rosetta Stone was that I was my first time at the British Museum. It was probably about 15 years ago or so. And I, by my way, okay, here's the Egyptian gallery, so it's all the sculpture. And I didn't look at any more kind of details because I was going to spend a few hours in the museum anyway. And I go in, I say, as soon as I get through the doors, this horrible crowd. So I get away from the crowds and just start going through these sculptures. I go through the whole gallery and then I'm like, where is the Rosetta Stone? <laughs> but it was the first thing that I passed, but I couldn't see yeah. it because there was so many people around it but now that I've spent so much time in the museum there are certain days when a certain times of day when you can yeah. actually get really really close to it and I find that when I do my guided tours there I'm usually in a kind of group of maybe four or five max, absolute maximum six that you just kind of how you could just tell people like just wait for a little bit because often there's a very very big tour group mm. that has just arrived and they stay there for about two minutes and then they move on and then you just have to kind of find that kind of cycle of different crowds arriving at the Rosetta Stone and kind of insert yourself between between two waves and then then you can get get close to it but uh yeah it's 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 quite because it's kind of in the middle of the yeah. gallery if, if no if, if someone who hasn't hasn't been there it's kind of in the middle of there and, and you kind of go through this quite a small doorway to get to the gallery itself and it's right in front of you so there isn't really any I kind of like the a reverse there. version of that story when I went to Heraklion I really wanted to visit to see the um, the, the Festos disc you know as this this mm -hmm. you know major bronze age find of this small clay disc because it's like 17 centimeters in diam diameter or something with these uh, imprinted signs on them so I, we we went through the museum and then at one point I, I saw it because we were in the room that was dedicated to that particular period and it was it's like this display case where you can walk all around it and the only thing in it is the the festos disc and I was the only one looking at it because everybody else was just walking past and not paying attention because they were like this this tiny little <laughs> thing in in a large display case and nobody noticed it and I was the only one so I called my wife and I was like look it's the, it's the festos disc and she was like what this is it I said yes this is it <laughs> so and then as we were looking at it then other people were also coming over and going like what are they looking at and they were like oh it's yeah. some sort of disc whatever but it's on all the t-shirts in yeah. in crete when you go there you know it's, it's the festival thing, but it's bigger on the shirts than it is on uh, in in real life so i was there and there was no one looking at this thing and i was like this, this is such a shame so, anyway I think uh, you can see the same thing in my uh, pictures of the face face dust disc in that like there's people in the galleries on the other side yeah. but I'm the only one looking at it at the time. I, I mean it might suffer because the Arachnid Museum has so much yeah. in it and it's so interesting like that the collection yeah. there. The face dust disc is very interesting from you know a historical perspective but visually there's just so much spectacular art and craft work there that I, well, I can there's, understand there's more it stuff that is in separate display cases it's like the the harvester vase which is beautiful and there too nobody mm. was looking at it so i think people were walking people were walking along the walls where you have the big display cases so they were doing like the the you come in mm. you take a, a right turn then you walk all around the room see everything that's lined mm. up against the walls and then you go into the next room and people weren't paying attention to the display cases that were freestanding except if there was something big in it like there was one display case in one room that has all of these mm. uh, minoan house models which is really cool and some people were looking at that but mm. Most people just, they, they file past the walls and then they go out and then they go into the next room and they file past the walls and then they go into the next room and then they just, they just, th th those, yeah. those freestanding display cases are, are, they get far less attention and they were meant to be focal points so it's probably a failure in, in exhibition design that they, uh, that they didn't, yeah. didn't succeed in emphasizing those more. Mm -hmm. I guess. Mm. I think that that's actually a good segue into talking about visitor experience in general and like some of the things that museums do right and wrong in terms of directing traffic, if you will. In Heraklio, a lot of visitors just look at the wall cases and kind of ignore everything in the center of the room. And I, I wonder if, you know, that basic layout is almost a poor choice for unguided tours simply because people will be drawn to more of a linear path through the museum and sticking to the larger wall cases and not necessarily looking at the the objects that are being highlighted which i guess in the case again of Heraclio are 
more historically significant or significant for scholarship, I guess? I went to the Heraklion Museum in 2013, before it was fully open. So the Bronze Age galleries weren't open, but the Feistos disc was still on a special display because that was something special that they didn't want to not have on display. So I don't know how much has changed, but from what I remember, like a lot of the stuff in the middle sections is three-dimension stuff. It's sort of the Dreros Apollo. I think it's also, is the Clay Athena also from Dreros? But it's things that you want to look at in three mm-hmm. dimensions. And in one of the rooms, which is the Knossos North Cemetery room, or one of several, there may be several of those, there's a vase that they say, the description sort of says, scene of hunting, on one side a uh, person with a spear and a net, and on the other side an animal getting hit by a spear. But the way it's displayed, you can only see one side of that, and there's no way to see the other side of it. So, personally, I want any object that you want to look at in three dimensions (laughs) displayed so you can see both sides sides. It's the same with the warrior vase from Mycenae. You've got the famous side facing forwards, and the other side of it is against a panel, so you can't see that. I mean, that is a valid worry. It's not really a visitor experience thing, because like in this case I'm kind of an exceptional visitor in that I want to look at very specific early Iron Age things from all directions. But you do sort of want like these displays to show three-dimensional objects in three dimensions. Sometimes the museum in, in Amsterdam, the Anna Pearson, has, I think also the, the, the National Archaeological Museum here in Leiden, they sometimes put mirrors behind objects when they're in a display mm. case. So there are mirrors. Sometimes they also put them on rotating platforms. So a small rotating mm. platform. So you have a, a you, mm. you can only yeah. do that with small objects uh, usually so that you can still see what the other side looks like even if it's mirrored not ideal but yeah no i understand what i what i use the 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 freestanding display cases because it's perfect because here also they have like this large Mm. panathenaic prize amphora and they use a lot of the greek pottery Mm. here they in in later they display in display cases that basically stick out from the wall so you can walk around it and see it from one side Mm. and the other side so you have so you can see the pots in from from more than one direction. So that's useful, yeah. The Capitoline Museum in Rome does something slightly different with one of the most significant pieces in the collection, which is the Aristonothos crater. It essentially is in a room by itself. I mean, there are other objects in the room, but it is clearly the focus of the room, and it stands in a case in the center of the room, so you can see both the blinding of Polyphemos and then the ship combat scene on the other side. And I know a lot of museums probably don't have the resources to have, you know, a dedicated room to just one object. But that, to me, is really the ideal way of addressing things like the Phaistos Mm. disc and maybe the Harvester vase and things like that. Just because, you know, they are things that you're trying to highlight by putting them in a different place within your museum. But if they're in these larger galleries, they almost seem to get drowned out. There is a simple way that they could solve it in the Heraklion Museum. Instead of having these freestanding display cases, they just have these display cases that jut out from the wall so you have you follow basically this path mm. where you're led across everything or led past everything but you can still see it from multiple angles if it's a three-dimensional object something like that mm. I mean that, that's something you could do I think that kind of I perhaps I have a controversial uh, opinion um, about kind of taking when you want to highlight an object take put it in a separate room because it's one thing that kind of in general terms what kind of bugs me in, in museums is the kind mm. of lack of context and I think if you're having things together with similar objects or related objects from the same region or different region for the same period it gives you this kind of better sense of things when you put one object into a glass case on its own that invites you to kind of walk around it and signals that this is something you want to look at in detail so people tend to perhaps perhaps yeah. but not with the festas disc according <laughs> uh, to your kind of stories but it kind of highlights that this is something that you should be looking at but as an archaeologist i kind of always like to think of objects not as on their own as kind yeah. of artistic achievements you know depicted in this or this scene but kind of who made them and, and what was happening at the same time so there's a risk there if you want to highlight something you're also removing part of that context yeah, yeah this is one of my personal bugbears that a lot of archaeology museums pretend that they're art mm. museums <laughs> in the sense that they showcase individual objects instead of actually you know uh, explaining to visitors why an object is important and that it imports that it derives its importance from the context like you said that it's it's not just yeah. the object in itself but the other objects associated with it that 
place where it's found, what archaeologists do with the objects mm. afterwards, all this sort of stuff. The old, uh, the the archaeology is a discipline basically. Instead of archaeology, mm. it's just this collection of treasures that you stick in a in a museum and then put a spotlight yeah. on it and then yeah. say, "Isn't this pretty?" Yeah. So this is the age of the displays because I can imagine that the Capsuline Museum hasn't really changed its Arsnothos crater display in four hundred years. It, it does not look like it does. <laughs> A museum I really enjoyed for its oldness, in a way, was the uh, Mykonos Museum on Mykonos. Hardly anyone was in there, surprisingly. But the Mykonos Museum is one of those museums that just has a bunch of vases in display cases. And you have the famous Mykonos relief vase, which is sort of central to the room and you can walk all the way around it. Even though the backside has no decoration on it, so you probably could put that against a wall. But it is just rows and rows of vases, and it's like this museum probably hasn't changed in 30 or 40 years and there you have in a way that's quite nostalgic and enjoyable in another way it is like this is taking vases and saying this is one discipline where you look at all these things together and you learn about vases rather than this is part of an assemblage that came from a grave and you understand it as a grave assemblage whereas and something like say the Agora Museum with its displays of the so-called rich Athenian ladies burial which has definitely been updated since 2000 2004 because it includes the facial reconstruction done for that year and the fact that she was pregnant and it has her the finds from that burial together and I think the Napthium Museum has similar things and plenty of other museums do this like this is a grave assemblage they're together from the grave uh, the Tyrans both rust deposit that is all together I think it's displayed separately so that with the ceramic shields with the centaurs and Amazons on it you can see both sides of those whereas the masks are hung on the wall because you know get as much out of seeing the other side of those but it's all together you can see it's part of the same deposit and that is a more modern way of doing it a lot of museums in italy and there is a bias in my visitation and research to the etruscan side of things but a lot of museums in italy do have at least one reconstruction of a tomb in them these days that actually shows and displays artifacts as they were discovered and quite a few of these have wall plaques with extremely good descriptions of the process of excavation excavating these tombs and descriptions of how and why we we find these types of items in these tombs but even you know back I don't remember exactly when it was built and first organized, but the Paolo Orsi Museum in Syracuse was already organizing a lot of their Greek displays by tomb. So if you tour the Paolo Orsi, in the Greek sections, most of the collection is from excavations in eastern Sicily, but they're organized by tomb, not by vase type, which really does give you a good idea of the co- the fine context for these items and typically they're i shouldn't say typically if i remember correctly i've only been there once the rooms are organized by location so you'll find tomb groups from specific excavations all together and it really does give you a much more holistic view of the archaeological circumstances than say the capitoline museum with its big beautiful collections but as pointed out everything's taken completely out of context text oh. in those settings. I think this kind of new museums and kind of new excavation, that sort of material more often gets displayed with the kind of a wider context because you have that context. Because if we look at kind of how the collections of the Vatican Museum or the British Museum came to be, it was a lot of these kind of private mm. collectors acquiring individual items. And that's something that then you just all you need to do is to look at the little information plaque and, you know, find place unknown. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of these kind of old collectors. So you, you can can't do that sort of similar type of uh, contextual information so I think that that plays a role in how these old museums and these old institutions display their objects. <laughs> Doesn't mean that they couldn't uh, <laughs> kind of recontextualize them but I think that's one thing that with these kind of places where they're perhaps not you know the most eager to update their displays every decade or so <laughs> probably uh, plays a role but I wanted to say another thing so you were uh, say kind of museums displaying things by sight. We were talking about our favorite museums museums earlier. This is my least favorite museum, the Kalamata Museum. I don't know if you've ever been to the Kalamata Museum, where the famous Kalamata olives come from. That museum, so it has to do with a senior, and it's this more or less just one big room, and they've used this lot of these smaller part 
partitions as if from kind of open plan office space and you have all the different sites and, and excavations in their own little corner there's no chronological organization even so for someone who is not very familiar with the region it is extremely confusing museum to go to. So you go from one display case to another and you might be jumping, you know, from the Bronze Age to kind of Byzantinian burials or something like that. And you're just kind of wondering. There were a few sites that I was familiar with that are like, oh, here's that one. There's that mirror that I've seen in a book. And then you just keep, you know, a lot of times just, you know, a few coins from some site that you don't know where it is and what's the significance. So it's clearly, a, they clearly joined their kind of organizing principle, but I'm not sure if it was very good way to the kind of general public or even yeah. kind of expert in the <laughs> in, in the region. The EOS Museum on the island of EOS, I don't think as an island it's been very heavily excavated. There are a few sites, but a lot of them are sort of early Cycladic and Neolithic sites. So the museum has a few uh, grave steely and a few, you know, typical classical things, but a lot of the display is about the bioarchaeology from the early Cycladic site. So about excavating the plant remains and other things about diet and so on. So it has a lot more information about like the excavation process and what we actually learn from finds that aren't the pretty objects. But in the English translation, there was like a funny statement that was like, the bones of sheep and goats indicate the presence of these animals, <laughs> which yes, it does. But it was still, it was interesting. Like most museums just wouldn't even mention that. So you are getting like a sense of the site from those museum displays. And maybe a counter argument to this is it's a lot of writing. So a lot of reading rather than things to look at. And of course, the museum was pretty much empty apart from me and Whitney because EOS is kind of a party island. So very few people were there for the museum. But it was sort of an interesting way of having like the island's archaeological museum, as they all have, that talks about the new excavations or recent excavations. And how that ties into what I was thinking about before is that with the Vatican Museum and Capitoli Museum and to some extent the British Museum, these are very old museums. Their display practices have not always been to display these objects for the public to look at. Like the Vatican was kind of like, these are parts of the Pope's home. That's why there's all these wall paintings, you know. This is the Pope's chapel that have been opened up to the public. And all of the buildings are sort of 200 years old or older. So they're not set up to display objects in this new way. And if you wanted to revitalize the displays in a way that emphasized context with what you can do that with, because obviously a lot of these come from collections that are not necessarily uh, legally acquired, <laughs> then you have to, you'd have to like redo the entire building. And that's expensive and not everyone wants to do that. And it takes time. So you're taking these objects off display for a while so people can't just come and see them. So so like the new museums, like the EOS Museum is maybe not the best example because it's a tiny island museum, but when the Ashmolean Museum's galleries were, were redone, they are now more of this style where it's by region and by theme rather than being just look at this pretty object. So like when museums have the opportunity to that, when they have the money to do that, they can do it, but it also requires sort of a huge restructuring of the space and closing things off for a while. Um, so this has led me to think of the Royal Ontario Museum. Are any of you familiar with the Royal Ontario Museum? Nope. No. So the Royal Ontario Museum is like an early 20th century museum that in the early 21st century they tried to expand it but there's not really any space to do it. So they sort of built this crystalline structure. It's called the Michael Lee Chin Crystal that sticks out of the building. And I recommend like doing a Google image search of the Royal Ontario Museum to see how this thing looks. And people are like, it looks atrocious, <laughs> ruins the building, but also it creates a huge space to expand your displays. So like, if your museum is full, well, now we've created some extra space to it by putting this weird crystal in <laughs> on the side of it that can house a lot more displays. I guess maybe it's similar with the pyramid in the Louvre, mm. where people will call it the scar on the face of Paris, but you know, it, it allowed the museum to have some more space. And these are museums with 
lots of stuff in them that they can't display. Too much stuff. Mm. Sooner or later, as you walk through a museum, fatigue starts to set in, and especially the larger mm. museums. I remember we went to uh, to Umbria on our on our honeymoon two years ago, and we visited the archaeological museum in Perugia, and it was like, oh, I guess we're done now. And then there was like another whole new area and then oh I guess we're done now oh no wait there's stairs up and then it was like an entire floor of stuff (laughs) and I had that in the British Museum as well where I just said I'm just gonna go to this this and this and the rest I will see some other time when I'm here because it's just too much and sooner or later you know you start off reading all the texts and it's, it's important for museums to organize the texts well, that you should have, you know, the A text, the B text, the C text. So it goes from, you know, a large title that you know where you are to something descriptive. And then, of course, the little plaques that describe the object. So you can find what you're looking for if you're looking for anything in particular. But also just have the museums, don't put too much stuff in there and, and don't make the museum too big. Because sooner or later, you just it, it, it all starts to blur. It just becomes this big blur of things and you're like, oh no. The Anacleon <laughs> Museum was just about the right size because I was able to, to go through everything and it, of course it was also subject of my my interest so uh, and then also go through the sculptures but and uh, see the frescoes but while I was going through the sculptures there were moments where I was like okay I'm going to skip this Roman stuff and <laughs> I'm just going to continue because it was, it was right on the cusp of being too big <laughs> so maybe it was a good idea that the pottery mm. department was closed I don't know so I prefer the museums yeah. to be more more <laughs> focused and that's I've I've I have a good relationship with the museum directors here in this country and I've talked about that as well that there is this problem where they're like you know we we have all of this nice stuff that we want to show to people but then on the other hand you have like you know what I'm saying that fatigue sets in and everything starts to blur together and you have to try and strike a balance Mm -hmm. between telling a particular story that you want to tell and not wearing out your visitors basically and that's sort of a problem and one of the ways you can resolve that is by switching up your exhibition frequently that you change your exhibitions but that's costly and time consuming and they don't always want to do that because they don't want to haul all of these you know breakable objects back and forth to to the displays the anthropological museum in vancouver that's also very nice and it has the entire depot so the storage that you normally don't see they have it on display basically it's on the basement Mm. on the ground floor i don't remember but it's basically all of these archival cabinets and you can turn a wheel to to open them and then there's a corridor and you can Mm. go in and it's just stuff packed behind glass and it's there are small labels and you can see what it is and basically they have everything on display just it might not be you know in a nice display case or or anything because they just want to be able to just show a particular thing at a time and not but if if you really you know if you go to a museum with a specific idea i want to see this thing and it's not in in the display case because they switch the the exhibitions around you can just go to that storage those archival cabinets and you can turn those wheels (laughs) and then go in and have a look at the thing you wanted to see (laughs) so that that's some sort of middle solution let's say that's a little bit what we were talking about in the beginning about kind of discoveries that you make in museums so this museum is clearly kind of encouraging that kind of you know this is our regular stuff but if you want to you know I suppose it's the kind of equivalent to yeah. writing an <laughs> article on Wikipedia you just click that <laughs> button and see what pops up Anthropological museums I really love anthropological and ethnographic they're really nice I haven't been to the one in Vancouver but the one in Victoria is beautiful I just remember turning those wheels because I was like I want to see what's in these things so I was like, turning one wheel after the other and just going going up and down the, the display cases. That's a bit like something that museums sometimes do with children, is that you have this kind of uh, little trails for the, for a uh, little museum visitors and they can go discover things. But then once you're an adult, you're supposed to quite, yeah. quietly contemplate in front of these objects, uh, beautifully displayed in these display cases that you can't always go around and kind of explore, which is, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, Matt earlier that you had been kind yeah. of shushed in, <laughs> in a museum. I get that all the time and I, I never kind of I don't think I have a loud voice but I don't really subscribe to the idea that you need to quietly no. think about and whisper in museums because I think you know that it should be a place so if you get a conversation going that it's, it's a place that should be encouraging that yeah th- this is one of the things Shanks and Tilly you know the the archaeologists who are at the forefront of the interpretive archaeology movement from the 1990s basically they complained that that one of the problems with archaeology museums is that they commodify everything so they they package all their mm. artifacts and then they sell you a ticket and then you can go and you can gawk at the artifacts and then you can 
get the hell out again. And they were complaining that, that that's not what uh, an archaeological museum should be about because they emphasize that archaeology is a social practice in the present. And they should they said museum what museums should do is encourage people to actually interact with the objects. So instead of just quietly standing there, you should be able to ask questions about the objects. You should try to get different opinions about what objects are and all this sort of stuff. I, mm. I once consulted for an exhibition at, in Amsterdam and then I suggested, you know, why don't you do, like have a display case that people can see from two sides with objects and then have two different stories on either side. So you have, you know, archaeologist A interprets all of these objects with these contexts in this way and then archaeologist B has a completely different opinion. And I used Greek warfare as an mm-hmm. example because of course I did. Mm-hmm. So it's, but you know, something like that that people that visit museums realize, oh, you know, it's it's not just, this is just a story that people can tell with these objects. There are different opinions and it's an interpretive act and I can also have an opinion on yeah. it. Yeah. And that sort of thing. And it's especially important in in museums mm. like to engage with people that are local as well to get them to interact mm. with their own history. So this is where my role in a museum comes into play. I find that as a museum curatorial administrator we have sort of a strange relationship with the tourism operators in that they want people to come and be in our local area and enjoy being here whereas we've got to like actually finish getting all our finds into our database and manage our collections and so on. We've got things to do that aren't really touristy, but within that, you know, we are still a tourist destination. You know, there's no point in having a museum if people aren't coming to it. And like, ideally, these are local people, but also, you know, wider area people. But anyway, within tourism, like one of the things that is really like getting pretty big and is doing quite a lot of business around here is what we call experiential tourism, where you don't go and look at a thing, you go and do a thing. So for in my museum, it's Butterchurn because we're sort of a pioneer museum in a dairy valley and like butter making and cheese making has been a big part of our history. So we do sort of old fashioned butter making and that gives people like a way into local history that is informative and entertaining because it's fun to do and then you like get to eat the butter. Um, (laughs) There's like a few different parts to it, but the point there is that you go in and you interact with the history in a way that you wouldn't normally normally do in a museum. And that I think you talk about going and looking at the display cases and walking through and that's sort of one way to experience a museum but what else can you do to sort of make this feel like more interactive? How can you get people to engage more with it, get people more interested in it? And I don't know, like for my museum it's a bit easier because we have historic houses or a historic house as part of it and quite a bit of space. Like I'm thinking about the Heraklion Museum thinking I don't know where you could do anything in there that isn't look at the stuff but you can also think about like if you're in a greek museum if you can like with things like 3d printing can you like copy some of these artifacts 3d print artifacts and talk about like how do you put together grave assemblages what would you dedicate at this sanctuary is this stuff you can do at a museum it's certainly stuff you could do at the site if you were thinking more about not just going and thinking hey look it's the Temple of Zeus at Olympia in ruins. I think virtually everyone that goes to Olympia runs on the racetrack. That's like everyone's memory of going to Olympia is having the race on the (laughs) racetrack, not seeing the temples. So like you want to get people to go places and do something that isn't quite as passive. I guess that's the point. Yeah, if you focus on archaeology as a discipline, you don't have to use the actual objects either. I mean, there, there are two things. Yeah. The Historical Museum in Stockholm, for example, it has the, the archaeology displays where it basically explains what archaeology is, and it also encourages you to basically interact with objects to organize brooms and, and, and brushes into a particular way and, and that sort of stuff. Mm. And when we were there at the height of summer, they also have like this open courtyard, and they were organizing stuff there so you could also shoot the bow and arrow for example mm. which my wife did we have pictures of her with the, with the bow and arrow so sometimes if a museum if it, if it has an open courtyard you can do stuff outside that is more interactive let's say and the the, the okay. same thing that I want to say because you don't have to use the actual objects if you just want to do if you want to engage people with archaeology because in that case the objects necessarily don't really matter and then i'm thinking of open air museums like close to here we have archeon which it refers to itself as an archaeological park 
and it has like three sections based on excavations that have taken place here in the Netherlands and it features reconstructions of buildings. So you start with the prehistoric era, so you get through the Mesolithic to the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, so you see how the buildings develop, how the houses develop. So you start from simple huts to more complex huts and then you get the Roman era where they've rebuilt part of, of a Roman town with a, a Gallo-Roman temple, so it's these, these typical square temples, and it also has an arena, and then you go to the medieval era where they've built part of a, of a large church and a, and a medieval shopping street. And so they have reenactors walking around and pretending to be people from those periods. And you can also ask them questions. So, you know, they'll be skinning a fish or preparing skins or making shoes or conducting a service or cooking something. And you can just ask them. And they also organize events. So you can go to the Gallo-Roman temple and you can see them preparing a sacrifice. And then you all have to take part as well. And you can go to the arena that's there and can see a gladiatorial combat and all that sort of stuff. You can touch everything. You can talk to everyone. One, and it's very interactive. You can go into the bathhouse, the Roman bathhouse, you can sit in the sauna if it's on and it gets very hot. And then you can see how they actually <laughs> heat it because you can also go downstairs and then you have you know, someone pretending to be a slave filling, you know, shoveling wood into the large furnace underneath so that it heats the entire system. And there's like a section where you can see how the air passes through the floor and the, the bricks and whatever. And that's it, it's great fun with kids, but also I, I took my wife there for her birthday one time. It's also great fun for adults. <laughs> <laughs> and you really get you really get an idea of what life may have been like in the past and it's very interactive and you can see all this stuff and they use the pots there's a, a potter that makes the pots you know the terra segalata for the romans i mean there's no greek stuff here of course and it's it's very interactive and it it engages people much more than just you know filing past display cases even though those are also important mm-hmm. because you know it's the original objects I think that like the difference between these two types of museums, what we've been talking about for most of this podcast is kind of the traditional antiquarian approach to archaeological artifacts and what we've moved on to is what I think at least in the US and what I was used to in the UK yeah. are called living history mm-hmm. museums. And I almost feel like it's kind of reflective of newer scholarly trends because you know for a very long time museums reflected the antiquarian ideals of scholars that you know some of these objects are this is what's important this is what we're teaching in our classes you know let's focus on these things but as we've moved into more of an emphasis on social history especially i think these living history museums have a lot more potential to get people engaged both with the past but also with modern trends and modern branches of scholarship because a living history museum has the ability to on the fly change how they're teaching and change the approach that they're using to engage people if there are changes in thinking on certain subjects, whereas the more traditional approach to a museum, again, kind of linking into what you were saying, Joshua, that it's extremely expensive and time-consuming to change out displays and, and rework the experience of a particular museum, that doesn't necessarily allow for it. Even traveling exhibitions don't necessarily allow as much freedom as a living history museum does for interacting with newer ideas. Yeah, it, it, it has a research, or, or it has research potential also, because, for example, here they built Bronze Age and Iron Age houses, which is basically all wattle and daub and uh, thatch roofs, etc. And then they just see, you know, how long does this survive? What's the maintenance that we have to do for this? And, you know, and, mm. and it helps, you know, usually there's trenches dug around it and you need to do that in order to keep water away from the walls and all that sort of stuff and every 20 years you have to rebuild it etc etc when when we were there one time there was a girl in the prehistoric setting that was mixing this uh, pink goo in a in a wooden bowl and we we are we asked what are you doing what's that pink goo and she said well this is brains from a deer that we killed (laughs) earlier (laughs) And we're going to, because we have this idea that in prehistoric times, they didn't let anything go to waste. And they may have used the brains because it's high in some kind of material, I forget what, that they use this to soften the skins. That's what we're going to try out now. Mm -hmm. So we were just standing there and going like, hmm, brains. (laughs) <laughs> interesting <laughs> but this is the sort of stuff that, that they do and it's it's very f- physical and and yeah, what you said Matt, experiential in a way that, that you don't really see in the traditional museums that we've talked about most i have to say so i enjoy cri- criticizing the british museum quite a lot because i think i just spend so much time there <laughs> but they do have i mean if, if you ever visit there it's worth going they have this kind of volunteers who always have this kind of set of maybe kind of three or four objects that from the kind of handling collection mm. um, and they will tell you what kind of that you can hold them, you know, in this kind of su- supervised setting. Uh, there was a, there was some sort 
of stone tool that you kind of she puts uh, with this volunteer that I had uh, one time she puts it in the visitor's hand so you could feel that even though it looks like just a random rock it actually perfectly fits your hand to do the task that you want to do with it and it's this yeah. kind of interaction with the objects that I think yeah perhaps not all museums can do it because you have to think about conservation and, and that sort of things but if you have this kind of flood of these stone tools that you know wouldn't be that worn because you've been mentioning that the historical museum in Stockholm so I used to live in Stockholm I, I went to university there as so I've been there a few times and it's one of those kind of when you interact with objects one of my first significant archaeological experience was when I went there and you can actually those polished stone axes if you know what I'm yeah, talking yeah. about you can actually touch yeah. them and it was one of those you have been studying archaeology for about a year or something and then the first time you can touch an object and, you know there's this <laughs> archaeological theory about you know you touch an object the object touches yeah. you I definitely got the, but the uh, both ways there. It, was, it felt like a very significant moment. Yeah. But I think this sort of, you know, interacting with the physicality of, of the objects is, 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 is very important. And, and this kind of, you know, reconstruction and kind of experimental project, I think it kind of engages the uh, audience in, in a different way than the, just kind of wandering the hallways and appreciating things in glass cases yeah. that it's quite passive passive experience. Yeah, I worked as a lecturer in prehistory for a short bit and at one point I invited a, a guy over who was a specialist in, in stoneworking and lithic materials basically. He came and he brought lots of flint with him and then he showed how to make uh, you know an axe or, or an arrowhead or something and then we handed out material to the students and we said okay you know, put put a piece of leather on your leg and then let's, let's hammer away and let's create some uh, flint objects ourselves and it, it's a very illuminating kind of thing to do and you could you could also do organize something like that in, in museums as well just have a corner and say you know this guy's going to be here every wednesday between you know three and six and go make some lithic objects there yeah yeah in a way you don't always have to be so complicated about it like we have the butter churning and some places you can do flint napping and like depending on your museum whatever you want to do you can put a lot of work into it and i mean a lot of the things that i'm thinking of like we do as like, educational programs or things we did as outreach work when I was at university. Like, a lot of these things will often be interactive stuff. But one of my former summer students, I can't remember what museum it was that she went to, but just went to a museum where they had rolls of paper hanging up in each room and, like, boxes of crayons and colouring pencils so people could just, like, grab a bit of paper and draw something or colour something and engage with like, what's on display that way. I think encouraging that kind of interaction with the display displays can be something you can do quite easily if you think about it. If you just want to like start off with something like there are pads of paper around so you can colour things in. There are brass things that you can do brass rubbings of if you're a museum with brass things that you don't mind people rubbing. <laughs> that kind of thing. And I think a lot of bigger museums do do this kind of stuff. But it's like stuff that you can be doing all the time so it doesn't have to be show up at a certain time so everyone comes and it's incredibly mm -hmm. crowded. There are some things you can do that aren't quite as labour intensive as having a person teach people something or show people something. And that's the kind of interaction you can encourage within museums. Yeah, the Anna Pearson Museum in Amsterdam mm -hmm. has Archeo Hotspot. There are more, I think, in the country. I don't know exactly. But that's where there will be someone in the room when you visit uh, who's working on something. And you can ask them questions what they're doing you know if they're if they're mending a pot or whatever and then you can also talk to them with the material and I think you can also do something there under their supervision so there are museums that are experimenting with that sort of stuff as well trying to make it more interactive they also have a new entrance I haven't seen it yet because of coronavirus and everything but where they have like this large display because the no longer Ella Pearson Museum it now also incorporates this special collections so it's no longer just archaeology you know the ancient world but it goes all the way up to the, to the modern era basically so they also have this large digital table if all is correct, where you can interact with maps. So they have like scans of the actual maps, which you can't touch obviously uh, and then you can just pull up these maps and you can play with them and you can look at stuff and you can zoom in and zoom out and all this sort of stuff so they are incorporating this more interactive element that is interesting not just for kids which is what what used to be you know the the, the kids got all the interactive stuff and the adults like you said had to uh, <laughs> had to file past these display cases and look seriously and read everything until they got, got all cross-eyed but now they're they're also incorporating more of the interactive elements in for for adults and asking questions and, and engaging with the material rather than just you know consuming it, which is what Shanks and City criticized mm. back in the day. Mm. Mm. So we've been kind of talking about this from our own perspectives, obviously, all four of us are PhDs and 
have very specific ideas about what museums should and shouldn't do in terms of engaging with people. But Helena, I think you're the only one who's really engaged with the public on a fairly long-term basis in the museum setting. What is it that clients usually are looking for in terms of engagement with the museum and its collection at, at the BM? So I, I've been doing this kind of private museum tour, so this kind of small small groups, and not these kind of huge groups with, with an umbrella, because I think then this kind of interactive element is, is impossible <laughs> to do. But it's it's mm. very often kind of a maximum six people, often it's for quite quite frequently just two people. So it's you kind of get to know people. And it's a three hour tour that I do and I talk about somewhere between maybe 12, 14 objects over three hours. But it's also the kind of, the tour itself is sold as this kind of, you will spend three hours in the British Museum with an archaeologist. So that's the kind of what the clients are expecting. And it's, it's very kind of rewarding work for me because I get to focus on an object for quite a long time. Well, I say long, but you know, 10, 15 minutes or so. <laughs> so it's, it's not, I mean, there's so much to say. <laughs> you know, you'll have to kind of dense it in. But the way I kind of think about when I kind of interact with clients is that they could be taken the audio guide and just walk around the museum but that's mm. not really the point and that's not from a kind of commercial point of view that's not the added value of, of having me there so mm. and with what we're talking about kind of contextual information often being kind of removed in these large museums so I kind of try to have this kind of balance between focusing on the object looking at it walking around it if you can and then providing this wider context and having a little bit of kind of conversation, like what people think about it, how they react, have they seen something similar, and having more of a conversation about an object rather than just people passively listening to it. So there's quite a lot of kind of social aspect to, to the work. But a lot of times, I have absolutely wonderful clients, they're all very interested and so you can get into this kind of theories of things, like, well, this is one interpretation, this is what archaeologists can do with this sort of object. However, other scholars have said this, and then the others counter this by saying that. And I think that's what people really react really well to. But also one thing that I'll, I'll kind of finish off with this. So I got kind of quite free reign on kind of what to choose and what to talk about. I can't skip the Rosetta Stone, but beyond that, I kind of change things quite a lot. After doing this for about a year, you know, you, you get quite familiar with the objects, so you want to do something new. And with my own background in Greek archaeology, I thought I'm going to tackle the vases, because the vases <laughs> rooms is what people walk past because they're displayed as these art objects you know <laughs> you can kind of see the Athenian vases they're a little bit more red and the Corinthian Boeotian well they're a little cream coloured uh, <laughs> and that's about it <laughs> so I kind of do this you know a little introduction you know what vases are and kind of really focusing on the function so as we were kind of talking about this kind of interactive elements in museums but we, I can't really do that but you can tell about you know what are these shapes what are they used for what does it look like this and you know often iconography reflects the, the function in, in some way or another and people are really I, I, I had to start when I start these tours I always tell them and then we're going to talk about vases and <laughs> half the time people are hiding their, <laughs> the way they're rolling their eyes <laughs> but I, I always think my intention that I'm going to get people excited about vases and I think I've had a fairly good response. I think I usually in a group of, you know, maybe five, one person picks the vases as their favourites, which I think is a great success rate because they're, <laughs> they're just vases. <laughs> but I think it's that kind of conversation and going a little bit deeper into the kind of functions and, and the wider context that people are really missing when you're this kind of yeah. passive observer, kind of visitor. My mother always said, <laughs> I never knew that Greek vases were actually interesting before you started studying them. Because she said, when I went to a museum, <laughs> yeah. I would just see rows and rows of pots and I'd be like yeah no, never mind and then she said and then I realized there was yeah. stuff on there and it, 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 they had functions yeah. and things <laughs> Yeah, but I think that's kind of museums are really terrible at that because if you look at the labels for the vases, it's you know it's this jargon name for the shape, no description of what it was used for. A lot of times, big museums don't even know where they came from. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. you know, and then like some sort of date range, and that's about it. And then you're supposed to just admire, oh, how lovely painting techniques they had, and then yeah. move on to the next one or the next. Some one. of those description plaques mm. are terrible. It's like you know, you see an object and then the car just says exactly the same thing that you can see with your own eyes and you're like okay this adds yeah. nothing to my knowledge <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well 
Yeah, I think even some vases look really interesting. Like in the British Museum, have some like eagle-headed writer mm. by Doris. I'm thinking of like a very specific thing, and then you get no context as to how it's used. I don't think. Or this is from my very swift run through the vases room as the person working there is sort of looking at his watch, being like, "How long is this guy going to take in this brick?" So maybe there was more of a description, but I think some of these things do look a lot more interesting than we're giving them credit for. But it's hard to know like what to say with why is this like this why why is Mm. half of this vase an eagle or a ram's head i think this is a very good argument though for the importance of Mm. guides in museums especially in small group settings like what you do helena because you can provide that context that the larger older style museums either can't or don't provide and i wonder if you know, the presence of more people working for the museums and things like that is one of the aspects of the living history museums that Joshua was just talking about. If having either reenactors or reconstructive archaeologists, however you want to view them, actually on site constantly and in larger numbers, if that's one of the things that makes them both more engaging and in some ways more helpful for people to understand mm. the past. Because, I mean, obviously with the big museums, you either have to seek out your own guide or use the audio guide which audio guides i've found to be either great or absolutely terrible i never use them (laughs) i've only picked up a few over the course of my time visiting museums but some have been relatively helpful but no replacement for a real person especially a subject expert i think in some ways like an audio tour can be a very useful tool sometimes i can't focus on reading that many museum labels and if an audio tour is just going to read the labels to me <laughs> in a way i find that helpful but yeah like an audio tour can't be specific to your interests it can't mm-hmm. respond to what you're excited about or what you're interested about a human being can do that and i do find even working in a small museum like when we have summer students so there are just more people around. It's a lot easier to like get people interested in stuff, to have the time to just engage with visitors and talk to them about things. And, you know, they'll always have questions. They always want to engage with the person that's there in a way that you won't. they won't engage with the labels. There, there is maybe a sort of a middle way. Last year, the um, Antiquities Museum here organized a Night of Aphrodite, they called it. Which, because normally museums here close early and now the museum was open until midnight, I think. It was specifically done to entice high school students to come to the museum. And I was asked to give a 10-minute lecture in the Greek department room, in this case about Assassin's Creed Odyssey, but, you know, referred to the objects that were there. So, you know, stone lekitos with a 4th century hoplite on it and that sort of stuff. But others were spread out elsewhere and giving, you know, 10-minute talks at a specific time about a very specific subject and then people will go there and they will be able to ask questions and interact and whatever. And that was also a very interesting way of highlighting a very specific thing, talking about very specific objects in the museum and sort of engaging with the the audience there as well, where you have basically specialists that you hire out for the evening or whatever to be there and to engage with the audience. So those sorts of events you can also organize in a museum where you get more engagement than just looking at the stuff but I, I never I never do audio tours I don't have the patience like I also have no I have zero patience for videos <laughs> I, I hate museums where they they funnel you into a room <laughs> to watch a, a 15 minute to sit there and watch a 15 minute video I'll say no thanks I can do that at home I just want to see the things that I want to see and I don't want to sit here and just consume because that's what it is I don't want to consume this this video of them someone talking to yeah. me and showing you pictures I want to be in control, basically. So There's a tendency here in Oregon for museums <laughs> to include videos of some kind. I don't know what it is, but especially museums that are a mix of natural history, Native American history, and more anthropological museums almost always have a video of some kind. Well, that can be useful. The Ethnographic Museum here in Leida also uses videos, and it usually uses videos very well. There was an exhibition on the Japanese geisha, which mm. was beautiful. It really went into the social cultural context, the history of geishas, and it also had videos that A, they were short, and B, they were very focused 
focus on a topic and you said this video is about this and then you could stand there you could watch mm. this free four mm. minute video of a client talking about his experiences meeting geishas or a geisha talking about you know what she went through to prepare or how things go your instruments that they played and all this sort of stuff and you know, so you would have like display cases stuff that you could walk around explanatory text and these very short videos that would play on a loop basically with subtitles in different languages so nobody was left behind as it were and that was really good and that was one of the few cases where I said oh, I like these videos I want more of these but, <laughs> but the museum here in Leiden the archaeological museum and Turkish museum also has like in the Greek department it has these booths where there's a bench and a screen and you put on a headphone and you basically you know you isolate yourself from everything that's going on you're, you're physically <laughs> removed from the actual space where there's the stuff you want to see to go and sit and watch this dreary video and that's I, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, that, that's no I hate that few things I was thinking of with regards to videos in museums. The last one I thought of, we had the art of Looney Tunes in the Woodstock Art Gallery in Woodstock, Ontario. That is really last cool. Last year or the year before. <laughs> yeah. So they had videos that were Looney Tunes cartoons. So that was a video I just sat Perfect. and watched in the museum. <laughs> But what I was actually thinking about, the first one I thought about was the Glace Bay Miners Museum in Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. And the Glace Bay Miners Museum is a coal mine that was working until, I think, the 1980s. Our tour guide had worked in this coal mine. And you get a guided tour of the coal mine, and you can't stand up straight, and you have to wear a helmet, and like, you wonder, how did anyone work in these conditions? And then you can go into the main museum and watch, I think it's a five-minute video, and that video is a chance to just have a rest having gone around this uh, mine. The other one I was thinking about was, uh, I think it's the International Workers Museum in Manchester. I can't remember what the museum's actually called. And that one has a lot of sound clips from speeches, so from rallies and so on. So you like press a button and you get these sound clips from actual recorded speeches. And that I think if the video footage is contemporary footage that gives context to everything else that's around, I think that is valuable. But yeah, if you're watching a 15 minute video made by the museum about this stuff, then that is something that you could kind of do at home before or after visiting. Well, you mentioned pushing a button, which is important because it's interaction. And, and you, you decide, you decide, I'm going to, I'm going to push this button and watch this video or listen to this sound clip. <laughs> So I'm not a huge fan of this kind of sit down to watch watch a video when, when I go to museums. I'd rather kind of explore a little bit on my own. I've got to talk about the kind of surprise elements sometimes you have in museums. But I had to say, in the past maybe two years, the British Museum, they've hired a new person, I think, for their special exhibition. They've done something really kind of wonderful with light. The first time I saw this was in the Ashurbanipal exhibition on the Assyrian king and your Assyrian empire. And they have this gigantic relief walls from palaces with these very complex scenes. And they projected light and colors on them, highlighting the different elements. And there was this kind of big battle scene, which is clearly there's there's a story there, but when you just look at it, look at the whole, you know, what was maybe eight mm. meters wide, it's really difficult to make out what's happening. It's just this kind of battle <laughs> scene, a battle enroding. So that was really smart. But one thing that they did recently, they had an exhibition on ancient Troy, mm -hmm. myth and reality. And going back to vases, so vases is a little bit tricky thing, I think, for people to kind of unravel on, on their own. And I thought I sometimes struggle. You see this lineup of characters, and you have to figure out what's going on. And they had one vase that showed, I think, it's Achilles angry in a tent, wrapped in, yeah. in a blanket. And uh, there's people queuing outside his tent. So it kind of looks like, oh, there's someone in a tent, and then people out outside the tent. That's what you tease out on your own. And they had projected this light on the wall just above this vase, where in this outline, so it was black wall and then you get the white light kind of projected on it with the outlines of the characters. And it showed you the kind of, told the kind of story of what's going on with the background. How did Achilles end up in this tent wrapped in this blanket? Why is he being so moody? <laughs> Why are all these people outside the tent? So it gave this quite kind of snapshot image that you have on the vase and made it into a narrative right next to it. And it wasn't that long. Or could it be maybe a minute or something? And I thought that was really great because vases are otherwise such a kind of passive experience, I think. Or regular visitors so I really enjoyed that otherwise I'm not a huge fan of this kind of video thing
feelings that you kind of just observe and listen to this audio track. But that was that, that's a new person <laughs> at the museum, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> and I, I salute that person. <laughs> well done. Yeah, I, I think those audio visual things yeah. they work when they're in context, basically. Like what I was said with the yeah. geisha thing, like you have these displays, and then there's this video, and it's it's about what you're seeing there. But it, it's yeah, you know, so you're not removed. Yeah, exactly. It's not like you know before yeah. you go to the exhibition. It's like you have to pay this museum tax in that you're funneled into this room and then you have to sit there and you have to watch this this thing for 15 minutes before you're allowed into the uh, into the rest of the museum i always skip it anyway but you know that that's really that that's that's hateful to me that that i, I don't like that at all <laughs> on that positive note <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this edition of the ancient world magazine podcast a list of the correct names and websites of the museums discussed in this podcast is available on our website ancientworldmagazine.com, where you can also find more articles and podcasts on a whole range of topics related to the ancient world. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review us, or go to patreon.com forward slash ancientworldmag to support us there. Thanks a lot.